Uh, what I will be presenting are strictly some thoughts that are still in the process of formation. So they're not fully, uh, fully formed, um, and it's not necessarily going to be pretty, uh, but hopefully um, it will be engaging, um, uh, and uh, we can perhaps um, uh, flesh things out a little bit further during the uh, discussion. So I basically took my cue from this, from this uh, notion of organizing difference and from the focus on organization that can be found in, in Marion's work and in the, in the publication uh, where we encounter terms such as uh, micro-organizations, um, um, self-organized infrastructures, and with self-organized infrastructures, the term organization already uh, becomes attached to that of, uh, of infrastructure. Um, and um, this is something that I want to try to flesh out at least a, a little bit. Um, what, is, what is the organizational um, issue, in a sense? What is the, the Organisationsfrage here? And how does, it, how does it relate to the notion of, uh, of infrastructure and to the notion of the, of the institution? So basically, that's the, the triangle. Um, organization, institution, and, uh, and infrastructure. Um, of course, we've already... Um, heard uh, some, uh, some of the speakers uh, reference uh, the uh, sort of various genealogies of, of institutional critique, of practices that uh, are known under that, uh, under that name, under that label of institutional critique. And um, actually, um, you know, what we're hearing increasingly is that, to quote uh, Ekaterina de Gaud, institutional critique is over. And then uh, what uh, Ekaterina de Gaud uh, says that instead, instead of this institutional critique that remains focused on certain uh, existing institution and critiquing them from sort of an imminent uh, perspective, instead, she writes, the door is open to reconstruct the very thing to construct or reconstruct the very thing that gives art scale, duration, and importantly, financial and organizational support. And this she terms institutional activism. So from, <coughs> from institutional critique that supposedly uh, remains in this double bind with the existing institution that critiques it and to some extent hopes to uh, transform it, um, or at least to reform it somewhat uh, from that kind of practice, we've gone to an institutional acti activism that tries to use the institution much more, um, um, let's say, much more radically and drastically for um, instituting uh, practices uh, that go beyond the mere critique of the museum, of the gallery, and so on. So the institution is, in a sense, instrumentalized uh, to generate structures, to um, uh, create organizational forms that um, use the institution as a, as a kind of a base or basis, uh, basis for actuelle kunst, um, but that, uh, you know, that uh, try to get out of this ultimately loyal um, a role that the artist or the, the ex-artist, the former artist plays as, uh, let's say, a critical uh, court jester. Uh, Marina Wischmidt makes a similar point in her contribution in, in the book, uh, Once We Are Artists, um, in which she criticizes, um, um, let's say, traditional institutional critique for always respecting certain legitimate bounds, uh, remaining within legitimate bounds of, you know, the bounds of the art institution, um, and I quote, artists and institutions were soldered together in an increasingly half-hearted tableau vivant of autonomy. So in critiquing the institution and its entanglements via sponsorship, etc., cetera, um, um, classical uh, historical institutional critique actually uh, uh, staged this half-hearted tableau vivant of, of autonomy because in critiquing the institution, the artist actually uh, to some extent, even if momentarily realized, actualized the modernist ideology of autonomy, precisely by laying bare the um, uh, heteronymous entanglements of the institution and of the uh, art system. Now, uh, Marina, um, in her brilliant article, then kind of um, uh, substitutes the term infrastructure for institution. So she proposes a shift from institutional critique to infrastructural critique. And she writes, and I quote again, 
infrastructure like institution is, is used here in a moderately flexible way, but chiefly to signal a view of the art institution as a site of resources. So there again, we have a certain instrumentalization of the, of the institution. It, it's becoming a site of resources, material and symbolic, and uh, that calls for an opportunist deployment uh, for the sake of furthering all sorts of projects rather than the loyal criticism attendant on institutional critique in its established version. Now, I will you know, sort of um, set the question whether that's a completely fair assessment uh, of uh, a historical institutional critique. I'll set it to one side. I, I don't think it is fair, but that's not really uh, the point here. The point is that uh, there is certainly a shift in emphasis uh, from um, sort of an imminent critique of the existing institution to its uh, repurposing, its retooling, its opportunist um, uh, deployment. Um, and uh, for that uh, purpose or in that context, Marina uses this term infrastructure to refer to, let's say, a broader uh, logistical apparatus uh, an apparatus of uh, appropriation and extraction that goes uh, far beyond uh, the field, uh, this uh, sort of Weberian uh, sociological field of, uh, of art. Uh, therefore also, uh, or in this way also, stimulating, let's say, uh, uh, transversal practices that uh, go beyond critiquing the institution and its, its heteronymous entanglement to actively pursuing various modes of entanglement with perhaps also indeed non-artistic groups, uh, activist groups, or indeed um, subaltern groups uh, such as uh, um, um, you know, refugees, uh, illegal immigrants, um, uh, domestic workers, uh, reproductive workers, and, and what have you. Um, so, um, yeah, Marina uh, also notes that infrastructural critique, using this term infrastructural critique, doesn't mean that the platform wins out over the content. That's another quote, a final quote from her text. So she does seem to acknowledge that there is, uh, you know, there is a certain danger here if we speak about infrastructural critique. It could uh, um, give uh, rise to the impression, to the illusion that, uh, in a sense, working with the infrastructure, working with the institutional and para-institutional infrastructure is all that uh, matters, or that it is an end in itself, rather than a means to an end. So she creates this dialectic here of platform and um, content. So the platform clearly is the, um, the infrastructure, or part of the infrastructure, and the content would then well, would be, would be what? Of course, you immediately start thinking in terms of uh, infrastructure and some kind of um, uh, superstructure, so which would then be the, the content. And um, uh, perhaps we could briefly also look back here at um, um, historical institutional critique and look at this, um, um, look at this uh, gesture by Michael Asher when he removed the partition between the white cube gallery space and then the office behind the back uh, wall. So suddenly the office and the work in the forms of labor uh, that were uh, going on in the back room in the office uh, became part of the exhibition space, which was no longer purely an exhibition space. So a kind of hybrid uh, space, a hybrid work slash exhibition space uh, emerged. And here you might uh, say that indeed the um, um, the infrastructure uh, of the gallery itself becomes, uh, becomes visible, which could be seen even if this is beyond the uh, horizon, let's say, of a narrowly defined uh, classical form of institutional critique. You might say that this then uh, is a first step towards uh, actually working with these forms of labor, with various forms of collaboration, and also going beyond the division of labor um, inherent in, uh, let's say, the gallery system, the artist producing work for the gallery, uh, the gallerists uh, uh, you know, showing the pieces and the assistants doing work, their work, et cetera. So indeed, um, uh, there is already a nucleus, you might say here, or a first step towards um, institutional activism uh, or infrastructural practice that actually tries to uh, reshape the way things are done, that really tries to work with various types of labor and that tries to work against, uh, let's say, um, a dominant um, division of labor. And uh, you know, ultimately what we're dealing with here are indeed uh, 
questions of uh, form and of structure. So uh, whereas in, of course, the modernist paradigm, uh, the white cube gallery space was precisely for the presentation of you know, autonomous modernist artistic forms. Um, here, um, I would say post-institutional critique, uh, the real labor of form is precisely uh, the work with, within and against um, organizational uh, structures and um, organizational and institutional infrastructures. Um, and um, what, we, um, uh, what we see is that on the one hand, uh, we have the attempt to indeed repurpose, uh, appropriate, um, opportunistically deploy certain existing institutions that might lend themselves to that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, we have, uh, for instance, in the uh, um, corporate slash bureaucratic behemoth of the university, the sense that, you know, there is really no way in which such an institution can be opportunistically uh, appropriated or deployed. Um, uh, and uh, we therefore have to create a kind of um, para-institution or infrastructure within uh, the institution, uh, you know, which is where, uh, of course, uh, Harney and Moten's notion of the undercommons uh, uh, finds its uh, point of departure. So uh, there is this rhetoric in Harney and Moten of uh, actually going underground or actually certain practices and certain networks, certain forms of collaboration and study being forced underground within the actually uh, institution, uh, the actually existing um, academic uh, institution. Uh, so the formation of maroon communities of composition teachers, mentorless graduate students, adjunct Marxist historians, out or queer management professors, etc. They have this whole uh, list um, of uh, people and practices, subjectivities and forms of collaboration that are deemed unprofessional uh, by the institution, by the academic institution. So here within this kind of structure that is in a sense uh, seen as being beyond a redemption or beyond uh, um, um, sort of opportunistic um, uh, deployment, um, we have uh, basically the project for a kind of imminent desertion. Uh, the, the, the institution is being deserted uh, by people who uh, basically uh, create an undercommons within it, in, its, in, in, the, in the infrastructure of the institutional structure. So we have various, let's say, lines uh, that uh, open up here, various lines of flight depending on uh, whether um, an existing institution um, uh, is, in a sense, capable of, of change and is capable of fostering uh, meaningful practice and the creation of meaningful uh, social forms, basically meaningful forms of life, of collaboration, or um, not. And, you know, this is also, I guess, where uh, a certain uh, academic fascination with the art world um, um, sort of uh, comes from, at least in uh, part, in that um, there are um, certain... Um, let's say, smaller institutions here that are, uh, at least in some cases, hospitable to uh, para-institutional um, uh, forms of collaboration and entanglement. Let me um, return briefly to um, one of the um, classical early texts, I would say, about institutional critique, certainly one of the texts in which the term uh, was first used uh, in any sort of meaningful uh, form, uh, an essay by Frederick Jameson on Hans Hake from 1986, um, in which uh, Jameson is indeed uh, one of the very first people to, to use that term and to apply it to Hake's work. And um, um, Jameson here uh, distinguishes between uh, the critique of ideology, which he identifies with uh, the superstructure, the superstructure in the Marxian uh, term, and then on the other hand, uh, the critique of institutions. So Jameson writes, the demystification of a static ideology begins in the realm of superstructures, which it positions and defamiliarizes by designing a putative functional relationship to the base. So there we have this Marxian superstructure base <coughs> um, um, dichotomy. And then Jameson continues, analyzes in terms of the base, however, uh, begin with institution. Analysis in terms of the base, however, begin with institutions such as the museum to which superstructural or ideological effects are attributed. These two analytical movements are rarely are symmetrical, but rarely coincide. And then Hake uh, proceeds to analyze, uh, 
Apologies, Jameson proceeds to analyze Hake's work in terms of that dialectic of um, um, uh, the critique of ideology as a superstructural activity and the critique of institutions or institutional critique, which he sees as a critique of the base. Now, you might say that in a way, um, uh, Jameson is surprisingly cavalier here when it comes to deploying Marxian concepts. He's surprisingly uh, loosey-goosey uh, because, strictly speaking, um, you know, the, the analysis of cultural institutions or the critique of cultural institutions such as, such as the museum would not necessarily be an analysis of the base, you know, again, in strictly Marxian terms. Uh, Marx, of course, distinguished between um, the base on the one hand, the realm of the productive forces and of relations of production, which is where surplus value is uh, generated under capitalism. This Marx terms the real foundation on which arises a legal and political ideological superstructure. And then this superstructure he defines in a more detailed manner in terms of legal, uh, political, religious, artistic, or philosophical, in short, uh, in terms of ideological forms. This is a, uh, a term that he uses. And through these ideological forms, including the forms of art, um, people become conscious of social conflict. So the social conflicts that emerge in the base, in the, in the realm of the productive forces and the relations of production are then played out uh, ideological in a somewhat phantasmagoric form uh, in uh, the realm of politics, religion, art, uh, in short, ideology. And of course, uh, we're uh, you know, living through a new uh, uh, wave of ideological uh, um, uh, battles uh, at uh, present. And um, what, is, what is odd about this, I would say, and this is really something I'm trying to uh, come to terms with in, in my work at the moment, what is odd is that on the one hand, in the 1960s and 70s, a certain narrative um, emerged uh, that argued that actually um, the, um, uh, the whole base superstructure division needs to be rethought or needs to be uh, deconstructed and uh, done away with even uh, because there is an increasing integration of art, of cultural production into the economic base, right? So uh, the creative industries is one neoliberal way of, of framing this and of conceptualizing this. So uh, art, culture in general is supposedly, has supposedly become economically uh, productive has become a site of surplus production in its own right. Now, one can criticize this in uh, accordance with certain theorists of, of Wertkritik, etc. I won't go into this, but this is certainly a dominant narrative that we find both in sort of a neoliberal incarnation, the creative industries, and in, for, in the form of a more um, um, leftist, uh, post-operist um, um, iteration, uh, the productive turn um, of, uh, of culture. Now, if we sort of accept that uh, narrative, then surely um, um, the um, conflicts that emerge in the uh, base will also play out much more directly in the superstructure, including the realm of art. And of course, we have indeed seen that uh, art, artistic production, cultural production in general has become increasingly more marked by, um, at the very least, a kind of symbolic awareness and acknowledgement of issues pertaining to uh, labor, uh, pertaining to precarity, uh, and so on. So indeed, um, you might say that um, the uh, sphere of culture and the realm of art uh, has um, internalized uh, the base uh, superstructure uh, dynamic or um, dialectic. Now, um, on the other hand, um, you know, again, if we use a strictly Marxian analysis, uh, art always had its own institutional infrastructure, right? So one has to disentangle these terms. We basically have two oppositions. We have base superstructure, according to Marx, and we have uh, infrastructure and whatever comes on top of uh, that. So um, the, uh, the uh, superstructure in the Marxian sense, legal, political, religious, artistic, uh, philosophical, ideological forms, always had, of course, um, an institutional infrastructure, right? You always had universities, museums, etc. Even in the 19th century, when Marx argued that these, um, um, you know, institutions and what they produce are not actually part of the productive um, base. Now, um, 
today, uh, when we um, accept or when we assume that um, um, you know, we are actually also part of uh, the productive base, that we are part of um, you know, the conflicts that emerge in the realm of productive forces and relations of production, and that this is what, in a way, also necessitates us to uh, engage with um, other types of, of laborers or non-laborers, including those who are even prevented by the state, by the law, from uh, um, performing you know, legal work, such as refugees. In that kind of situation, um, the question how we use this infrastructure, uh, not just as being limited to the traditional institutions of art, but precisely as uh, being part of a much uh, more general uh, logistical, uh, legal, economic war machine, uh, is indeed of paramount um, importance. And um, let me uh, begin to wrap this up by again focusing and focusing somewhat more pointedly, hopef hopefully, on uh, the question what all of our infrastructural activities, what all of our you know, organizational activities, all of our attempts to uh, find meaningful and, uh, well, productive uh, modes of, of working together, of um, indeed organizing uh, differences and uh, finding commonalities, uh, let me focus on the uh, impact that those, um, let's say, infrastructural and organizational activities have on... Um, manifest form on, uh, you know, the articulations, the one might say indeed superstructural, artistic, ideological articulations of all this organizational infrastructural work. And you might say um, that um, Farid's presentation has already given us some pointers as to how this actually uh, can meaningfully unfold. Because with Ruan Grupa, for instance, the, um, um, you know, the um, um, critique of traditional gender roles, for instance, uh, the uh, engagement with maintenance work, with, with the kitchen, let's say, um, is of course not limited to um, the way in which Ruan Grupa uh, works, let's say, uh, behind closed doors. The point is precisely that, you know, post Michael Escher, there no longer is a door, there no longer is a wall. Um, and the uh, work, you know, the collective working through uh, of those issues um, actually informs uh, the production of uh, Ruan Grupa. And the um, uh, collective work generates um, images, uh, projects, events um, that, um, uh, you know, that are indeed informed by the uh, superstructural um, activities. Um, and I, I would say that indeed I, I would very much uh, want to introduce the notion of, of information here. So we have the uh, organizational work of the collective or of a whole network of collectives. Um, we have this kind of self-organizing uh, activity, this kind of self-organizing labor, uh, but this in turn has to inform certain, um, let's say, results that are presented uh, in a way that we might perhaps somewhat anachronistically describe as uh, public. Um, this is also very much what Marina um, addresses, I think, in uh, stating that um, you know, it's not about uh, the platform winning out over the content. So content, I would here actually uh, uh, reframe in terms of an articulated uh, public form for um, the uh, uh, processes that uh, begin with infrastructural activity. Let me just um, end by saying that, you know, in recent times I also do, uh, I have noticed a kind of new uh, superstructural turn, for instance, in the responses to um, the election in the United States. You know, there was a kind of panic about, oh, the, you know, the right is so good at producing memes, uh, you know, and there's this fetishization of this notion of, of the meme and of meme magic, you know, as though we've been all way too busy, you know, with our, uh, you know, with our infrastructural activities. We've all been busy with our folk politics. We've been so busy organizing among ourselves that the right basically has taken over uh, um, the internet, um, which, uh, you know, of course, uh, 
is an acknowledgement of, of, of a real problem um, that certainly has become clear. Uh, but on the other hand, it cannot be simply about saying, okay, we have to, uh, you know, we have to forget about all our sort of fetishistic focus on, on organizing. Um, you know, the real world is, is, is out there, uh, not in here, and we need to get our act together and produce progressive memes or leftist memes or what have you. Again, I would say that here, um, you know, these uh, have to be, um, uh, let's say, infrastructural manifestations that are informed uh, by precisely the kind of practices that we're uh, discussing and uh, presenting here um, today. So there has to be uh, a dialectic, and one good classical example, uh, I suppose, for this is um, the way that, uh, you know, Occupy launched this brilliant we are the 99% meme, which um, in a sense articulated a social division um, in a brilliant way that then allowed for uh, coalitions uh, to form and for a certain, uh, let's say, structured organization of difference uh, within the context of, um, of Occupy. Occupy was not, let's say, folk politics that focused purely on, you know, the physical assembly to the detriment of, of any other uh, kind of manifestation. Occupy was also a meme machine, but it was precisely a social uh, meme machine that um, um, also uh, had to come together, had to congregate, um, and whose um, uh, organizational infrastructural um, activism uh, informed uh, its other um, manifestations. Um, okay, I'll leave it at that. <laughs>